Welcome to Becoming Bossy and the first data analytics lecture. Today we will discuss the seven V's of data, the differences between unstructured, semi-structured, and structured data. We will discuss data mining, the different types of data analytics, and the difference between exploratory and confirmatory analytics. If you're ready to learn about data analytics, then do me a favor and click the like button because you will like today's lecture. If you are a loyal subscriber to this channel, welcome back and thank you for watching. So let's talk about the seven V's of data. There are seven V's when it comes to data. Variability, visualization, value, veracity, volume, variety, and velocity. Variability means that data is very variable and is constantly changing. Even data sets can be variable, ranging from low values to high values, changing as time progresses, etc. Visualization means translating data, such as percentages, figures, variances, trends, and other data into graphs, charts, diagrams, and visual exhibits. Value refers to the benefits that organizations, companies, governments, and individuals can receive from data. As you may know, data can provide new insights and assist with the decision-making process. Veracity means data must be verifiable and accurate. The numbers don't lie. The data does not lie. Users should be able to verify the truth or factual nature of data. Volume refers to the amount of data. For example, if you have ever worked in Microsoft Excel, then you may know that Excel has a limited capacity for data with a maximum amount of a little over a million rows that can be populated into Excel. So many professionals who use big data use more voluminous and capable tools such as big databases or access databases. Variety of data means that data can be in different types of formats such as structured, semi-structured, or unstructured. It can be in plain text format, an HTML format found on web pages, picture formats such as JPEG, and more. Data velocity means that data can be generated and created at different speeds, quickly and fast, much faster than manual operations. For example, Formulas in Excel can be used for calculations within seconds. Big data files can be downloaded and even transformed into different file types within minutes. So now that we are familiar with the seven V's of data, let's answer our first practice question. Actually, before we do that, if you like the information that you have heard so far, hit subscribe below to become a subscriber to the channel and turn on your notifications so you can be the first to know when a new video is published. Number one, data velocity refers to A, the truth of the data, B, structured or unstructured data, C, the speed at which data is created, recorded, and stored from devices, or D, the amount of data available. Remember, Data veracity means that data can be verified and it is true or factual. So we know that A is not the correct answer because that refers to data veracity. And the question is asking about data velocity. Data volume means the amount of data available. So we know that D is incorrect because again, we're concerned with data velocity. So we're down to either B or C. Structured or unstructured data refers to the type of data that is captured, identified, and stored. So we know that this choice does not relate to data velocity. Therefore, C is the correct answer. Data velocity is the speed at which data is created, recorded, and stored from devices. Remember that we just talked about variety of data, so we will dive deeper into unstructured data, semi-structured data, and structured data. Unstructured data sources include external data that exists outside of an organization, such as website blogs, text messages, text and emails, image files, and audio files. 
unstructured data can be found in audio and video files as well. It is not arranged or organized in a specific scheme, format, or model. Structured data sources include sales invoices, credit memos, contracts, sales orders, data in Excel, financial statements, credit card transactions, and inventory records. Unlike unstructured data, structured data is in a standardized, organized format that can be easily summarized or transformed into useful information. Semi-structured data is partially structured and partially unstructured. Think of web pages in HTML and XML web languages. So now that we are familiar with unstructured, structured, and semi-structured data, let's answer practice question number two. If you are still with me, type I'm still here in the comments section. I'm still here. I want to see a lot of unstructured data in the comments. <laughs> Number two, which of the following is an example of unstructured data? A, numbers in an Excel spreadsheet. B, open text in emails. C, amounts on an invoice. Or D, purchase order numbers. Keyword here, we are focused on unstructured data. Remember that information in internal documents, such as sales invoices and purchase orders, represents structured data so we can eliminate choices C and D. In addition, numbers in an Excel spreadsheet represent structured data as well because it is in a fixed cell or fixed field and it usually has a, has a specific format. So the answer here is B. Open text in emails represents unstructured data. Now we will learn about data mining. When studying for the CIA exam, you may hear words like data cleansing, data analysis, and data mining. Data mining is the application of advanced data analytics and database technology to uncover and discover hidden trends, patterns, outliers, and relationships in data that may not be immediately apparent. It involves analyzing data for relationships and insights. For example, Data mining can be used in a governmental capacity to detect financial fraud, detect criminal activities and patterns, and analyze scientific research. It can include discovering trends and patterns in virus infections in the country. Data mining can also be used in the private sector to perform market research, understand customer demographics, such as the amount of customers who fall in certain age ranges, and can be used for market research to answer questions like what geographic locations purchase advanced technology or use mobile apps the most? Data mining may reveal that large tech hubs in the U.S., such as Silicon Valley, which is in California, have populations that use more advanced technologies. So now that we're familiar with the data mining process and what it is and its uses, Let's answer the next practice question. Number three, data mining involves A, validating that data is correct, B, cleansing or normalizing data, C, obtaining data from the source, or D, discovering patterns and trends in data. Now, one of these answers may stick out to you because the answer here may be pretty obvious based on the discussion that we just had. We know that data mining involves discovering trends and patterns in the data, so D is the correct answer. Now let's discuss why A, B, and C are incorrect. Well, validating if data is correct relates to data analysis and not data mining. We analyze data and verify data to prove that it is correct. Cleansing or normalizing data also involves data, anal data analysis to ensure that data is standardized and clean. For example, Removing leading spaces from data fields or formatting numbers and digits in a specific number or into a specific currency type represents cleansing and normalizing data. It is a step that is needed to be performed before conducting an analysis and does not relate to data mining at all. C, 
Obtaining data from the source is a stage in the data analytics process. So it is clear that D is the correct answer. Discovering patterns and trends in data. Since we started discussing data mining and data analysis, let's focus on the types of data analytics that could occur. There are numerous types of data analytics that exist. However, for the purpose of studying for the CIA exam, I will focus on the more common types, which are predictive analytics, embedded data analytics, descriptive analytics, prescriptive analytics, and Benford's law of the first digit test. Predictive analytics is all about predicting or estimating future outcomes based on analyzing past data, historical data, or current data. Remember, predictive analytics describes what could happen in the future. For example, when analysts forecast stock prices or forecast and estimate the next quarter's company revenue amounts, they generally use predictive analytics to predict what could happen in the future. Embedded data analytics includes data visualization tools and data dashboards. Embedded data analytics are a part of the predictive analytics as well, as embedded data can be used to visualize and integrate analytical capabilities into real-time reports and dashboards. This provides value to customers or to users because those visual dashboards can analyze existing data to predict future events. Descriptive analytics refers to describing what has already happened. Describe is the root word in descriptive, so that's a big hint when you take your test. Think of gift sales that occur during a holiday season or home improvement sales that occur during the spring season when homeowners are more likely to work around their house and go outside in their garden. Descriptive analytics can help companies know what types of inventory were most popular or, mo or most purchased during a major holiday season or which home improvement supplies were most purchased during the last spring season based on historical sales. Descriptive analytics is used to describe what has already happened in the past. It is a traditional form of data analytics. Prescriptive analytics helps executives and business owners decide what should happen. I remember this by thinking of the root word prescribe, prescribe. A doctor may prescribe medicine because it is what you should take or ingest to feel better or to prevent an illness. It is what you should do and how you should fix an issue. A business example of prescriptive analytics is when the CEO or chief executive officer seeks the best outcome and analyzes various options to get to a goal or when airlines have to determine ticket prices based on customer, dem customer demand, travel locations, and upcoming holidays. All of these are examples of prescriptive analytics. Benford's law of the first digit test can be used in fraud investigations to detect unusual patterns in data that may lead to discovering fraudulent transactions and manipulation of accounting records. To summarize Benford's law, it says that the first digit in a set of data that is free of fraud is usually either one, two, three, four, or five. However, a transaction is more likely to be fraudulent if a data set starts with six, seven, eight, or nine. So it's just that simple. Now let's answer question number four. Number four. If an internal auditor wants to determine if there are duplicate payments for a particular vendor, which of the following type of data analytics should be used or would be used? A, diagnostic analytics, B, descriptive analytics, C, prescriptive analytics, or D, predictive analytics. Okay, so the question is asking how an internal auditor can detect 
if duplicate payments were already made to a vendor. We can eliminate choice C because the internal auditor is not trying to fix an issue or figure out what should happen. We can eliminate choice D because the internal auditor is not predicting, estimating, or forecasting a future event or outcome. Rather, the internal auditor is concerned with past events that have already happened. That's a big hint. Diagnostic analytics is more of a filler term that is irrelevant in this situation because diagnostic analytics is concerned with why an event has happened. It is diagnosing an issue or a problem. We can eliminate choice A. So B, descriptive analytics is the correct answer because the internal auditor wants to determine or detect if duplicate payments were made in the past to a vendor. The internal auditor wants to describe a past event. So descriptive analytics would be the most useful tool. If you made it this far, go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you have not subscribed yet. Like this video and comment. I am almost finished because we have one more topic to discuss, which is actually closely related to our data analytics discussion. What is the difference between confirmatory analytics and exploratory analytics? To explain this succinctly, Exploratory analytics is utilized to compile and understand data. It explores the data to reveal trends, patterns, data distribution, etc. For example, it can relate to finding ranges in a data set, such as salary information, or finding the mean or average in a data set. It does not provide a simple yes or no, confirm or deny answer like confirmatory analytics. Speaking of confirmatory analytics, this type of analytics is utilized to test internal controls to determine if the control is inadequate or adequate. In other words, if the control is effective or ineffective, operating effectively or not operating effectively. Confirmatory analytics determines if an employee is in compliance or out of compliance with the employee handbook, for example. So I think we have a grasp on the differences between exploratory analytics and confirmatory analytics. Now let's answer our final question. Number five, which of the following would require an internal auditor to utilize exploratory analytics? A, determining the lowest amount and highest amount in a file of transactions. B, determining if an internal control is functioning as intended. C, determining if items on the fixed asset list exist. Or D, determining if a department is compliant with federal regulations. Remember, we are focused on exploratory analytics in this question. So let's use the process of elimination. Looking at B, which is determining if an internal control is functioning as intended, determining if it's functioning or not is an example of confirmatory analytics because we are seeking to confirm or deny the adequacy of a control. So that is not the answer. Look at C, we are confirming or denying the existence of an item on a fixed asset list. This is confirmatory and not exploratory. Finally, we can eliminate D because determining if a department is compliant or non-compliant with federal regulations is similar to confirming or denying compliance. So the answer is A, determining the lowest amount and the highest amount in a file of transactions. Why is it correct? It is correct because the internal auditor seeks to analyze the data and discover the data's distribution or range by determining the lowest amount and the highest amount in a file of transactions. Ooh, that was a lot of information. I hope that you found it very useful and helpful. We made it. If you made it to the end of this mini lecture, type in the comments, I made it. Also, I gave you free valuable information. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel because we are on the journey to 1000 subscribers. Thank you for watching and I wish you the best as you continue to study to become a certified internal auditor. Also, 
If you could, in the comment section, let me know if there are specific topics that you would like me to cover. As always, stay blessed and stay bossy.